Buenas tardes a todas las personas presentes el día de hoy. Doy por inaugurada la audiencia número 15 del 184 periodo ordinario de sesiones de la CIDH que lleva por título seguimiento de recomendaciones de nueve informes de fondo publicados y 16 medidas cautelares relacionadas con la pena de muerte y el corredor de la muerte y que fue convocada de oficio por la CIDH. Quiero empezar también excusando a nuestra presidenta, la comisionada Yulisa Mantilla, que por un eh, compromiso médico no puede acompañarnos el día de hoy. Mi nombre es Estuardo Ralón, soy primer vicepresidente de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y estaré presidiendo el día de hoy la audiencia. Y me acompaña eh, el comisionado Joel Hernández, eh, la comisionada Roberta Clark. Asimismo, también se encuentran presentes la secretaria ejecutiva adjunta por un monitoreo, María Claudia Pulido, y el secretario ejecutivo adjunto de peticiones y casos, Jorge Mesa. Esta audiencia tiene como objetivo dar seguimiento al cumplimiento de las recomendaciones de la CIDH emitidas en nueve informes de fondo y 18 medidas cautelares sobre personas condenadas a muerte en Estados Unidos que permanecen en el corredor de la muerte a la espera de la ejecución. La audiencia es innovadora al reunir dos mecanismos de actuación de la CIDH para la audiencia, el mecanismo de los casos y el mecanismo de las medidas cautelares. La comisión expresa su esperanza de que esta audiencia de seguimiento abra un camino de diálogo y acercamiento entre las partes que promueven el cumplimiento de las recomendaciones que se han emitido en estos informes de fondo y de medidas cautelares. Asimismo, la comisión espera promover estrategias conjuntas con las partes para la implementación de las recomendaciones que se siguen a través de esta audiencia y anuncia que esta audiencia permitirá reforzar la estrategia de seguimiento de estas decisiones. Inicio con un cordial saludo a la representación del Estado y a la sociedad civil y asimismo quisiera explicar la distribución del tiempo. Tendremos inicialmente 20 minutos que serán utilizados por los representantes de las víctimas y beneficiarios. Posteriormente, el Estado también tendrá 20 minutos para intervenir en la audiencia. Luego pasaremos a un tiempo de 20 minutos de intervención por parte de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, para luego tener 12 minutos de comentarios de los representantes de los beneficiarios e igualmente 12 minutos del Estado y luego ya cerrar con comentarios de la comisión. Así que una cordial bienvenida, y de esa cuenta pasaré la palabra a los representantes de las víctimas y beneficiarios por un tiempo de 20 minutos. Pueden hacer uso de la palabra. Thank you, Commissioner Rallon. Good afternoon, distinguished commissioners, vice president, assistant executive secretary, and representatives of the state. My name is Anita Sinha. I'm an associate professor of law and director of the International Human Rights Law Clinic at American University, Washington College of Law. My role is, in, is to introduce the representatives of petitioners who will present today. We have coordinated amongst ourselves to address common themes across our cases. Our intent is to highlight global issues concerning the death penalty and death row in the United States, and we will submit both case-specific and global recommendations in writing following this hearing. I will introduce the full list of representatives now in the order in which they will present. First, we will hear from Francisco Serrano, son of petitioner Nelson Serrano, who is currently on death row in Florida. We will then hear from Therese Michelle Day, chief of the Capitol Habeas Unit in the Office of the Federal Public Defender for the District of Arizona, and Jordan Berman, assistant federal public defender in the Office of the Federal Public Defender for the Southern District of Ohio. Ms. Day and Mr. Berman's remarks will focus on the issues related to serious mental illness. Next will be Mark Marr, who is a staff attorney with the non-governmental organization Reprieve. Mr. Marr's remarks will include the application of the 1963 Vienna Convention on Consular Relations in cases involving foreign nationals. Last for this opening segment will be remarks from Juan Carlos Vega, 
representative of petitioner Victor Saldano. Our final remarks after the time allocated to the state and distinguished commissioners will be given by Jonathan Amnoff, Deputy Federal Public Defender with the Office of the Federal Public Defender for the Central District of California, and Cesare Romano, Professor of Law at Loyola Law School, Los Angeles. Our last prepared remarks will be from Sandra Babcock, Clinical Professor of Law at Cornell Law School. And so with that, Mr. Serrano, I yield to you. Thank you. My father, Nelson Serrano, is the oldest person on Florida's death row at 84 years of age and has spent the last 20 years of his life incarcerated. I have created the opportunities to talk to ex-wardens and prison guards over the past two decades to verify that mistreatment of prisoners is the norm. Culturally, systemically, it is acceptable practice for guards to also be tormentors of mind, body, and soul of these inmates, especially on death row. My father has ailments related to age, malnutrition, and medical neglect. These conditions are sufferance enough, but exasperated by the lack of medical attention, and if received, the poor quality medical care delivered by a system without oversight. While incarcerated, my father lost his eyesight in one eye and is losing his eyesight in the other from macular degeneration. My father's only occupation is to keep his sanity, which he does through reading more than a thousand books, responding to letters and emails, playing games and watching TV and movies, all activities that use his one good eye, a treatable condition with over-the-counter meds that he gets but sporadically while guards taunt him that he won't know what's coming once he becomes totally blind. He's almost completely deaf. He waited almost three years to get his last hearing aids fixed. He has heart disease for the last 20 years, but in the last 20 months, that heart medication was not given to him three times, each for a period of several weeks. He did not know if he was going to die or wake up in the morning when he did not have his medication. On top of that, he's been waiting for dentures for more than five years. Since then, every morning he takes string from his uniform and ties his teeth together so he can chew. And then every night he cuts that string, removes his teeth so he doesn't swallow them during the night. Put that with high blood pressure, prostate cancer. He needs a hip replacement, osteoporosis, and this is his medical condition. But this is where I wanna talk about the ADA. Where is the federal enforcement? The Florida Department of Corrections lost a lawsuit in Disability Rights Florida versus Julie Jones, Secretary of the DOC in 2016, where plaintiffs sued defendant alleging a widespread pattern of failures to comply with the American Disabilities Act the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the Eighth Amendment, and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. After substantial litigation, the parties reached a comprehensive settlement agreement in 2016, where the DOC was going to make sweeping changes in the way it treats its prisoners who are deaf, hard of hearing, blind, have low vision, or have mobility impairments. For over two years, the plaintiffs worked with the defendant to assist with the implementation of these requirements. However, the defendant even though he had a substantial amount of time to come into compliance, failed to do so in numerous ways. Florida prisoners with physical disabilities are still suffering from lack of accommodations, aids, and services, and are still being excluded from DOC programs, services, and activities like going outside because of their disabilities. The DOC has substantially breached their settlement agreement, and the plaintiff therefore filed another lawsuit seeking specific performance. The DOC lost that second lawsuit in 2020, but in all of this time, where was the federal enforcement of the ADA? All of these are horrid examples of human rights violations committed by Americans against Americans. They need to stop. Prisons, medical contractors, and ADA compliance needs human rights oversight with enforcement authority, or else we can't call ourselves the protector of human rights, justice, and democracy. That's what I came to say. I thank you all for hearing. My name is Therese Day. I'm an assistant federal public defender for the District of Arizona. I'm here today on behalf of my client, Pete Rogovich, a prisoner who's been housed on Arizona's death row for 27 years, the majority of which have been spent in solitary confinement. Mr. Rogovich suffers from schizoaffective disorder, a serious mental illness, which is a combination of schizophrenia and manic depression. The seriously mentally ill are the most vulnerable persons who have been sentenced to death. Their diseases are generally associated with hallucinations, delusions, disorganized thoughts, and significant disturbances in consciousness, perception, and memory. These symptoms can cause severe impairment in major areas of functioning, 
such as cognitive capabilities, normal developmental processes, vocational capacity, and social relationships. Like persons who have intellectual disabilities and juveniles, persons with serious mental illness do not possess the culpability necessary to place them among the narrow category of those who are eligible for the death penalty. The characteristics of people with serious mental illness also increase the likelihood of wrongful execution and make it unlikely that the penological interest of deterrence and retribution can be served by the imposition of the death penalty because of their reduced moral culpability. As the commission found in its published merits report for Mr. Rogovich, the execution of a person with a mental disability not only violates international law, but is particularly cruel, inhuman, and degrading. The European Union has likewise declared that the execution of persons suffering from any form of mental disorder is contrary to internationally recognized human rights norms and neglects the dignity and worth of the human person. There is currently momentum in the United States to eliminate the death penalty as a sentencing option for this category of people. The American Bar Association has for over 15 years maintained that the death penalty does not serve any effective or appropriate penological purpose when it is applied to persons with serious mental illness. Similarly, every major mental health association in the United States has urged eliminating the death penalty as a sentencing option for persons with serious mental illness, including the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, and the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. There have also been efforts in state legislatures across the country to abolish the death penalty as a sentencing option for persons with serious mental illness. Two states, Ohio and Kentucky, have enacted legislation, and bills were introduced in a number of other states, including South Dakota, Tennessee, Missouri, North Carolina, Texas, Arkansas, and Virginia that would exempt persons with serious mental illness from the death penalty. Given this national movement, the time is ripe for Congress to consider eliminating the death penalty for persons with serious mental illness. The representatives of the federal government who are present today are in the position to encourage the Biden administration to propose federal legislation that would eliminate the death penalty as a sentencing option for defendants with serious mental illness who are charged with federal capital crimes. The Biden administration has been a beacon of hope for marginalized persons by, by promoting that all people should be treated with dignity and humanity. Federal legislation eliminating the death penalty for these vulnerable persons would serve as a model for state legislatures to do the same. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to the commission. My name is Jordan Berman. I am an assistant federal public defender for the Southern District of Ohio. I'm here on behalf of my client, Samuel Moreland, an inmate on Ohio's death row. Even though this commission had already granted precautionary measures on his behalf, the Ohio Supreme Court nonetheless recently granted the state's motion to set his execution date. At the same time, however, uh, as Ms. Day mentioned, Ohio has become the first state in the country, now followed by Kentucky, to pass a law prohibiting the death penalty for those with serious mental illness. The Ohio legislature passed this law with overwhelming bipartisan support, as well as with the support of major mental health organizations, faith groups, and various public officials. Ohio's law requires a diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, or delusional disorder, and the person seeking relief must show that at the time of the alleged aggravated murder, the serious mental illness significantly impaired the person's capacity to exercise rational judgment in relation to the person's conduct with respect to either conforming the conduct to the requirements of the law or appreciating the nature, consequences, or wrongfulness of the person's conduct. Mr. Moreland, who has been diagnosed with both, both schizophrenia and delusional disorder, is in the midst of litigating his claim for relief under this law. The law has been in effect since April 2021 and provided current death row inmates with one year in which to file a petition seeking relief. While I heard predictions that every death row inmate would attempt to get relief, in the end, less than one third of them actually filed. And many of those petitions will likely be withdrawn or negotiated prior to further judicial proceedings. In other words, there does not appear to be a great strain on judicial resources. 
At this point, only three individuals have been removed from death row under this law and resentenced to life without the possibility of parole. All three were not contested by the local prosecutor. This commission has recognized that the imposition of the death penalty for a person with serious mental illness violates the right not to be subjected to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment recognized in Article 26 of the American Declaration. The U.S. officials on this call should encourage the Biden administration to propose legislation prohibiting the death penalty for federal inmates with serious mental illness, or at least to develop Justice Department policy declaring such persons ineligible for the death penalty. The United States has already prohibited the death penalty for those less culpable, such as juveniles and those with intellectual disabilities, and the same prohibition is required here. Good afternoon and thank you to the commission. My name is Mark Mayer. I'm here on behalf of petitioner Linda Cardi. I'm also speaking on behalf of Amy Knight, who is here on behalf of petitioner Ronaldo Barra. The state should take further steps to ensure compliance with this commission's recommendations regarding violations of Article 36 of the Vienna Conventions on Consular Relations, which the commission has recognized as a component of the fair trial rights of foreign nationals. The International Court of Justice in Avena recognized that the United States must provide review and reconsideration of convictions and sentences where the authorities have failed to notify a detainee of their rights under Article 36 of the VCCR. Despite this decision, the United States Supreme Court precedent has made domestic enforcement of Article 36 difficult. We appreciate the efforts the state has taken to ensure enforcement, for example, by including Avena implementation in its budget proposal for fiscal year 2022. We encourage the state to push aggressively for congressional legislation to ensure affected foreign nationals receive the review to which they are entitled. Additionally, we, aware, we are aware that the state has developed a guide for local officials regarding their notification obligations under Article 36. We welcome and applaud these efforts, but they do not go far enough. The recommendations of this commission relate to past violations and the state's efforts to educate local officials about their notification obligations do not repair these past violations. We are not aware of any case before the commission in which the state has conceded that an Article 36 violation was prejudicial or of any steps taken to implement the commission's recommendations to repair violations in completed cases. While we do not expect the state to concede prejudice in every case, we encourage the state to approach these cases dispassionately and to objectively evaluate whether petitioners' fair trial rights have been violated through non-compliance with Article 36 of the VCCR. There are other actions the state could take to ensure compliance with this commission's recommendations. For example, the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty, or EDPA's, state procedural bars severely limit the federal judiciary's ability to recognize and remedy violations of Article 36. By eliminating or, or easing these bars, the state will ensure that more foreign nationals receive the review and reconsideration to which they are entitled by giving federal courts greater ability to recognize and remedy these violations of Article 36. Additionally, the state could request to appear as amicus curiae in state court cases where Article 36 has been violated. The US government's position carries great weight with state courts in interpreting international law, and it can be decisive in persuading states to adhere to their, to their obligations under international law. Finally, it is important to note what is at stake here is not just compliance with the Commission's recommendations for compliance sake. These are life and death decisions. Both the American Declaration and the United States Constitution agree that states may not take life without a fair trial and the due process of law. If the state is devoted to human rights and compliance with the American Declaration, it will take steps to remedy past violations of Article 36. Thank you. Entonces, tengo el placer al presentar el doctor Juan Carlos Vega. Señor Carlos Vega, usted puede empezar. No escucha. Dale. Ahora sí. Hola, Anita. Mi nombre es Juan Carlos Vega, soy argentino, abogado del condenado a muerte Víctor Saldaño. Eh, que está en el corredor de la muerte hace 27 años y yo soy su abogado hace 23 años. Tres aclaraciones previas y dos propuestas. 
Se supone que esta audiencia es para eh, buscar medios para que los Estados Unidos cumplan con las recomendaciones y las medidas cautelares. Tres aclaraciones previas que son indispensables. Primero, para los Estados Unidos, la declaración americana sobre derechos humanos tiene valor jurídico vinculante o no. Segundo, en el caso Saldaño se ha probado el racismo en la imposición de la pena de muerte. Es decir, el racismo existe en el sistema judicial de los Estados Unidos, según la Comisión Interamericana, tanto en la primer condena como en la segunda condena. Tercera aclaración, ¿qué podemos hacer para defender a la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos frente a la conducta de los Estados Unidos de no cumplir las recomendaciones y de no cumplir con las medidas cautelares. Porque está claro que si los Estados Unidos no reconocen el valor jurídico vinculante de la declaración americana, que es la piedra jurídica central sobre la cual actúa la Comisión Interamericana, no nos explicamos cuál es el sentido que tiene que los Estados Unidos participen ante la Comisión Interamericana, en la Comisión Interamericana o en el Sistema Interamericano de Derechos Humanos. Esta es una pregunta central. Si la declaración americana carece de valor jurídico vinculante para los Estados Unidos, no tiene sentido que participen en el Sistema Interamericano. ¿Qué propuestas hacemos nosotros? La primera propuesta que hacemos es tomar el caso Saldaño, dada que allí se ha probado el racismo, este es el único caso donde se ha probado racismo judicial, tomar el caso Saldaño como precedente en los términos del sistema anglosajón, cumplir con los mandatos de la comisión, es decir, trasladarlo a Saldaño de inmediato a un psiquiátrico, porque no puede estar en otro lado, el precedente de Suering contra Reino Unido es clarísimo, en el sentido que con cuatro años en el corredor de la muerte, se degrada un aparato psicológico. Y en segundo lugar, lo que Estados Unidos le proponemos que haga, que cumpla con el segundo mandato del informe de fondo y repare integralmente a las víctimas por 26 años de tortura o de tratos o penas inhumanos en base a racismo. Este es, si no lo hace Estados Unidos, que la Comisión aplique el artículo 48 y el artículo 59, capítulo 4, inciso B. Eso es todo. Muchas gracias. Muy bien. Entiendo que ha finalizado la participación de los representantes de la sociedad civil y de víctimas y beneficiarios. Así que traslado por 20 minutos la palabra al Estado. Thank you very much, distinguished commissioners, civil society representatives, uh, representatives of the individuals on death row, and also to the members of the public who are following us. My name is Brad Fredden. I'm the uh, United States interim permanent representative to the Organization of American States. And I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon. Uh, let me start out by saying that the United States strongly supports the work of the IACHR. And we regard the institution as vital to the promotion and protection of human rights in the Western Hemisphere. These public hearings play a key role in the American, excuse me, in the inter-American system to ensure that OAS member states are mindful of human rights challenges in their respective countries. We recognize the, that the United States, like all countries, has work to do. The U.S. government is committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons. And today, we're here to listen to any and all concerns. We are here at the invitation of the Commission to discuss the death penalty and death row in the United States. 
Together with my colleague from the U.S. Department of Justice, we will provide information regarding the U.S. legal system and U.S. practices, U.S. Uh, practices and policies uh, for the commission's record and for civil society. Uh, beyond, uh, beyond that, we will um, um, note that the United States takes its commitments to the inter-American system, including its non-binding commitments under the American Declaration of the Rights and Dues of Man, very seriously. But we remind the Commission that in the United States view, the reports and recommendations of the Commission, as well as its recommendations for precautionary measures, are not binding on the United States under international law. Moreover, the United States would like to state for the record that we understand this to be a hearing of a general nature under Article 66 of the Commission's rules and not a petition-based hearing under Article 64. Today, since this is a hearing of a general nature, we are here to talk about our policies and practices generally. We are not in a position to discuss specific cases or answer questions about specific cases. I would now like to welcome my colleague, Richard Burns, Chief of the Capital Case Section in the Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, who's here with me today to address this important topic. Mr. Burns. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Burns and I serve as the chief of the capital case section in the U.S. Department of Justice. I've been involved in litigating capital cases from both the defense and the prosecution sides for 28 years. I'd like to begin by thanking the commission for its important work in this area. Capital punishment continues to be a subject of vigorous debate within the United States. But I think everyone would agree that if we are to have a capital punishment system, it must be conducted with extreme care where our defendants' rights are scrupulously honored. Capital cases involve the severest punishment available under the law and have profound consequences for the accused and the victim's families. Everyone involved in such cases must ensure that all parties are treated fairly. Recognizing the significance of capital punishment, the United States has established legal systems designed to limit application of the death penalty to the most serious cases and to provide defendants with an extensive array of trial and appellate rights. As you know, the United States is governed by a federalist system. The U.S. Constitution grants states broad powers to regulate their own general welfare including enactment and enforcement of criminal laws, public safety, and corrections. Thus, the individual states retain primary responsibility for defining and enforcing the criminal laws, including those relating to the death penalty. Currently, 27 U.S. states have the death penalty as a sentencing option, 23 do not. The federal government also has authority to prosecute some types of crimes, but its criminal jurisdiction is more limited than that of the states. On July 1st, 2021, Attorney General Garland issued a memorandum ordering a review of certain Department of Justice policies and procedures with regard to the federal death penalty. The memorandum directs the Deputy Attorney General to lead a multi-pronged review of recent policy changes to DOJ's capital case policies and procedures. That review will include a review of the addendum to the federal execution protocol adopted in 2019, a review to consider changes to DOJ regulations made in 2020 that expanded the permissible methods of execution and authorized the use of state facilities and personnel in federal executions, and a review of recent changes to capital case provisions in DOJ's justice manual. The memorandum requires the reviews to include consultations with a wide range of stakeholders, including relevant DOJ components, other federal and state agencies, medical experts, and experienced capital counsel, amongst others. No federal executions will be scheduled while the reviews are pending. Uh, I prosecute cases in the federal system, so I do not have expertise in the particular laws applicable in each of the states. However, 
the death penalty systems established by both the federal and state governments must comply with the United States Constitution, so I can address constitutional requirements applicable to all capital cases. To begin, the, the Constitution prohibits state or federal governments making a death sentence mandatory for any crime. It also flatly prohibits capital punishment for certain categories of defendants, those who are insane, intellectually disabled, or who commit the crime before they turn the age of 18. For defendants not in those categories, their constitutional rights begin well before trial. Defendants are entitled to receive notice of the charges, which includes notice that the accused person is facing the possibility of capital punishment. Once charged, the accused is entitled to representation by legal counsel at every critical stage of the prosecution. If the accused is indigent, counsel is appointed at the government's expense. Prosecutors are required to provide the accused with discovery of its evidence, including any information that is potentially exculpatory as to either guilt or sentencing. The accused is entitled to a public trial at which he can confront the witnesses against him, present his own witnesses, and testify himself so he cannot be compelled to testify should he choose to remain silent. He is entitled to be tried by a jury of his peers, and he can prevent a juror from being seated by exercising challenges to the juror's ability to be fair and impartial. The defendant is entitled to the assistance of experts at trial. If he cannot afford them, they will be provided at government expense. Such experts may cover issues such as DNA, fingerprints, ballistics testing, wrongful identification, mental health, medical examiner's reports, et cetera. The defendant is presumed to be innocent and can be found guilty only when the jury is unanimously convinced of his guilt by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Even when a defendant is convicted of a murder, he or she is not legally eligible for capital punishment unless some additional factors, usually called aggravating factors, are also established. Examples of such aggravating factors are that the crime was committed after substantial planning and premeditation to cause death, that the killing was committed in an especially heinous, cruel, or depraved manner, or that the defendant killed multiple victims or particularly vulnerable victims, such as children and the elderly. To meet constitutional standards, death penalty systems, whether in the states or the federal government, must narrow the category of defendants who are eligible for the death penalty. That purpose is accomplished by the court holding a sentencing hearing, which mirrors the guilt-innocence phase of trial. The prosecution presents evidence relating to the alleged aggravating factors. The defendant is again entitled to confront witnesses and present his own witnesses and evidence in mitigation. The jury is required to consider any relevant evidence the defendant offers in mitigation relating to the circumstances of the offense and or the character, record, and background of the defendant. A defendant's mental health, for example, or his impoverished upbringing often provide evidence in mitigation. The jury must be determine, again unanimously and beyond a reasonable doubt, whether any alleged aggravating factor is established. Absent such a finding, the defendant cannot be sentenced to death. If the jury does find an aggravating factor established, it then considers all the evidence, both aggravating and mitigating, to determine whether to impose a death sentence or a lesser sentence. If a death sentence is imposed at trial, the defendant is then entitled to a robust system of appeals. The United States appellate process affords those convicted of capital offenses the highest level of internationally recognized protection. The U.S. appellate process provides avenues for both state and federal court review of every criminal conviction. In addition, federal habeas corpus procedures enable federal courts to review the substantive and procedural merits of every death penalty sentence imposed by state courts. Appellate review in the United States ensures that defendants' trials are fair and impartial, that convictions are based on substantial evidence, and that sentences are proportionate to the crime. It is an individual's right to take full advantage of mandatory and discretionary appeals at the state and federal level and is not uncommon that many years pass before this extensive appeals process is completed. Whether the case was prosecuted in the state court or federal, the defendant has the right to make a direct appeal, covering a wide range of potential legal issues that arose during the prosecution. 
if unsuccessful in his direct appeals, the defendant next has an opportunity to, to bring constitution-based claims of error in the federal courts via habeas petitions. Habeas petitions very often assert that the defendant received ineffective assistance of counsel at trial in violation of his Sixth Amendment rights. Such petitions begin at the federal district court level and can be appealed through the federal circuit courts and ultimately to the United States Supreme Court. If his habeas claim fails, the defendant may have opportunities to submit a subsequent habeas petition. Defendants can additionally go to the courts to challenge the competency to be executed and the method of execution. I've spoken thus far about general rules for capital cases imposed by the US Constitution. I'd like to mention briefly some additional rights for defendants in the federal court system. By federal law, a defendant charged with a capital crime has the right to appointment of at least two attorneys, one of whom must be learned in the law of capital cases. There is a federal public defender system that provides counsel to indigent defendants at no cost, and within the Federal Defender Organization, there is a group of capital litigation specialists who provide training to counsel defending capital cases and, as needed, litigation assistance. The Federal Defender groups also maintain a list of private sector attorneys with capital case expertise who can be appointed to cases the Federal Defenders are not able to accept. Federal law also requires courts to instruct juries in capital cases that their decision on sentencing cannot be based on the defendant's or victim's race, color, religious beliefs, national origin, or sex, and requires the jurors to sign a certificate confirming that they followed that instruction. Federal law also entitles death sentence inmates to obtain post-conviction DNA testing of evidence. In addition to the many constitutional and statutory rights afforded capital defendants, the federal government's recognition of the seriousness of these cases led it to establish a set of Justice Department policies governing the process by which the department authorizes a case for capital prosecution. That process involves a multiple layer review of every potential capital case, starting with the local U.S. Attorney's Office that charges the case running through a centralized review by a Justice Department committee in Washington, D.C., and culminating in the Attorney General's personal decision whether to authorize a capital trial. During that review, irrelevant references to the defendant's or victim's race or ethnicity are removed from the material to minimize the risk that implicit bias may affect the decision. Additionally, the policy states that no final decision to seek a death sentence will be made without first giving the defense team a reasonable opportunity to present mitigating information for the department's consideration. Even after a case is authorized for capital trial, the defense may request withdrawal of the authorization based on changed facts and circumstances, and such requests are reviewed by the centralized committee in Washington and as warranted by the attorney general. I understand the commission is concerned with the potential impact lengthy periods of confinement may have on inmates sentenced to death. Courts in the United States have consistently rejected the argument that delay in execution can constitute cruel and unusual punishment under the U.S. Constitution. Long periods of detention on death row are often the result of a constitutionally mandated exhaustive appeal process. This process exists to ensure the protection of other human rights including the right to a fair trial, the right to life, freedom from arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, and the right to due process of law. While detention on death row is likely physically and psychologically stressful for many capital prisoners, it is often lengthy because the United States provides numerous opportunities for further review to ensure that appropriate issues get adequate review by the court system. Though I am no expert on confinement issues, I understand that in January of 2016, the Justice Department announced the results of a, re of a review of use of restrictive housing in American prisons. The study concluded that there are occasions when correctional officers have no choice but to segregate inmates from the general population, typically when it is the only way to ensure the safety of inmates, staff, and the public. But as a matter of policy, the study noted that this practice should be used rarely, applied fairly, and subjected to reasonable constraints. The report includes a series of guiding principles for limiting the use of restrictive housing across the American criminal justice system, 
as well as specific policy changes that the Bureau of Prisons and other Justice Department components could undertake to implement these principles. Since the report was issued, the Bureau of Prisons has adopted the majority of the recommendations and continues to take steps to implement them and to ensure that inmates are housed in the least restrictive setting necessary to ensure their own safety and the safety of staff, other inmates, and the public. For example, the Bureau has a national policy designed to help ensure standardized and appropriate treatment to inmates with mental illness. The policy objectives include, among other things, identifying inmates with mental illness through screening, extending support for inmates with mental illness beyond traditional professional services through creation of supportive communities, specialized staff training, inmate peer support programs, care coordination teams, and institutions with specialized mental health missions, enhancing continuity of care through a network of accessible treatment providers when inmates transfer between institutions or to the community and reducing the proportion of inmates with mental illness in restrictive housing settings. U.S. law also provides for federal oversight of state or locally run correctional facilities. Under the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, the Special Litigation Section of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division can investigate complaints concerning conditions in state or locally operated prisons, jails, and correctional facilities. When a pattern or practice a systemic deprivation of constitutional rights exists. The Civil Rights Division has the authority to initiate civil action against state or local officials to remedy the unlawful conditions. Inmates also have the right to file complaints about the conditions of confinement on such matters as inadequate medical care or deprivation of life's necessities, such as shelter, heat, clothing, sanitation, etc., which are then adjudicated through an administrative review process. After exhausting their potential administrative remedies, federal law permits inmates to file their claims in court under Title 42, United States Code Section 1983, asserting deprivation of their federal rights where they receive independent judicial review of their complaints. I hope my statement today demonstrates how the United States, through its constitution, laws, and policies, strives to implement its capital punishment systems with full respect for the rights of defendants from the time a case is charged to the time a sentence is carried out. Thank you for your time today. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Eh, hemos tomado nota de la intervención del Estado y ahora pasaremos a la intervención por parte de la Comisión Interamericana por un lapso de 20 minutos y iniciaré dándole la palabra a la relatora de país, la comisionada Roberta Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Alon, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I want to start off by appreciating all of the information that has been shared with us uh, by both uh, the the, by both parties and also to ask before I, I ask my questions would it be possible for us to receive copies of your presentation um, in particular uh, Mr. Burns you gave us a lot of information about the legal regime and the policy regime around uh, the federal response to the death penalty so it would be really useful if we can get a copy of that uh, I have just two or three questions um, we're here talking about the con conditions of confinement of persons on death row and there is no contest that there are quite a few persons on death row who have been in solitary confinement for extreme well for very long periods of time we've heard of 27 years 23 years and uh, those conditions are characterized by the almost complete absence of human contact uh, absence of um, ability to be outside of a, a rather small cell for 23 hours a day and the, 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 the prison conditions have been well described. Um, I was struck, um, Mr. Burns, by your uh, assurance that the, um, the U.S. state takes very seriously its human rights obligations and, and to, to quote you, you said you treat the death penalty with uh, extreme care, I think those were the words that were used, and rights are scrupulously protected. 
Um, you also took us through a, a tour, uh, a summary of the legal regime related to the, 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 the protection of human rights of persons on death row. And I suppose what I really want to ask, and I think it's at the heart of the question, under the, um, the, the U.S. Constitution, while CS delay does not, is, has been held not to constitute cruel and unusual punishment, what is the legal regime or what is the, what is the jurisprudence on confinement of 27 years while it's on death penalty? And I understand also the point being that persons may on, be on death row for a long period of time because they're exhausting uh, domestic remedies and appeals processes and so on. But of course, you can be in protracted processes but not held in solitary confinement and not in solitary confinement where you're also denied or not receiving medical care. So I, I would sort of just like to get a sense of what the jurisprudence is around solitary confinement and violative of constitutional rights. Um, in relation to the question of uh, Mr. Serrano reason, and the, I, yes, we do understand that this is a, a hearing of, 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 of some generality, but Mr. Serrano raised some points specific to his, um, his father, and he, he's raising the question of the denial of access to health care. Um, uh, his father is also suffering from mental illness. And so my question, and he's also raised the prospect that, and to which you yourself, I think, affirmed, Mr. Burns, that the federal government, there is a capacity to engage with the state where federal rights have been violated. And specifically in relation to what Mr. Saran has offered us today, he says that his father's rights under the ADA, I think that's Americans Living with Disabilities Act, have been violated, but the federal government is not enforcing um, the rights under that act. So I would also like to get some reflection on, on, on you know, how this ADA can be uh, triggered for persons who are on death row, in solitary confinement, suffering from mental illness, denied medical treatment, how can that, um, that provision be accessed? I have some other questions, but I'll stop here because I know the other commissioners also have questions. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, comisionada Clark. Le paso la palabra al comisionado Joel Hernández. Eh, muchas gracias, muchas gracias, eh, presidente, por la oportunidad de poder intervenir en esta audiencia. Empiezo por eh, saludar tanto a las organizaciones solicitantes como a los representantes del Estado por su presencia. Aquí coincido plenamente con, eh, el, con el departamento, con el Estado, en cuanto a la naturaleza de esta audiencia, esta es una audiencia que se enmarca dentro del artículo 62 del reglamento de la Comisión eh, y tiene por, el propó por propósito el intercambio de información entre las partes interesadas y la Comisión para el mejor entendimiento de los, de los problemas. Eh, no hay ninguna duda al respecto sobre la utilidad de este tipo de audiencias Y, y reconozco mucho la presencia eh, de las autoridades de Estados Unidos porque eh, uno de los propósitos principales que tiene la Comisión es la de entablar un diálogo y exhortamos siempre a todos los Estados miembros de la OEA a acudir a estas convocatorias. Dicho esto, también quisiera saludar aquí la presencia de abogadas y de abogados y también de defensores públicos aquí presentes que han tomado la causa de las eh, personas que se encuentran sentenciadas a la pena de muerte. Porque sabemos bien que la pobreza está subyacente en muchos de estos casos y son personas que no tienen los recursos para poder llevar a cabo una defensa técnica efectiva a través de sus propios, de sus propios medios. Creo que también es importante aquí destacar los avances que venimos observando en Estados Unidos y en nuestra región para abolir eh, la pena de muerte. Tengo que reconocer aquí un hecho, y es la, eh, la, eh, el, eh, la soberanía que tiene cada estado para poder decidir sobre la eh, legalidad o ilegalidad de la pena de muerte. Pero el mundo, la comunidad internacional y un buen número de países que, que integran la comunidad internacional han hecho avances significativos hacia la abolición de la pena de muerte, precisamente porque la pena de muerte está considerada como un trato, este, eh, como una privación arbitraria de la vida y la, la, la permanencia en el corredor de la muerte 
ha sido considerado un trato cruel, inhumano eh, o degradante. En ese sentido, he eh, es, escuchado con mucho interés eh, avances significativos para limitar la pena de muerte en Estados Unidos. Creo que es un avance el hecho de que eh, eh, personas que sufren alguna discapacidad mental, menores de edad, eh, no sean sujetos a la, a, la pena, a la pena de muerte. También creo que es un hecho significativo que alrededor de 23 estados a nivel estatal hayan abolido este, la, pena, la pena de muerte. Pero creo que también es importante seguir avanzando en, la, en, en una en objetivo compartido al interior de la comisión y es la de alcanzar la abolición absoluta de la pena de, la pena de muerte. En, las, en, esta, en esta audiencia se, se, se inserta en el marco de informes de fondo adoptados por la comisión y medidas precautorias. No es nuestro propósito entrar al análisis de cada una, pero sí establecer algunas características en su conjunto. Y tanto en los, infor en los informes de fondo, la Comisión ha establecido responsabilidad internacional eh, debido a eh, falencias en el debido proceso seguida en contra, de las en contra de las personas condenadas a la pena de muerte, incluyendo también eh, el trato cruel, inhumano, degradante que significa permanecer en el corredor, en el corredor de, la, de, la, de la muerte. Yo quisiera aquí también eh, señalar que no es este el espacio para hablar de la naturaleza jurídica de las recomendaciones de la Comisión, sea en informes de fondo o en medidas precautorias. Pero sí quisiera recordar lo dicho por la Corte Interamericana en repetidas ocasiones, más recientemente en su opinión consultiva 26 diagonal 20, en donde señala que la Declaración Americana de los Derechos Humanos en distintas este, disposiciones, constituye derecho consuetudinario internacional. Pero más importante también recordar que la, la Corte Interamericana ha señalado la obligación de los estados de hacer sus mejores esfuerzos para dar cumplimiento a las recomendaciones de la Comisión. Y señalo como fuente la Corte Interamericana, porque sabemos bien que conforme al artículo 38 del Estatuto de la Corte Internacional de Justicia, una de las fuentes eh, eh, complementarias del derecho es pre precisamente las opiniones autorizadas de los tribunales, en este caso un tribunal internacional, el, el tribunal internacional eh, en, especializado en derechos humanos de nuestra, de nuestra región, la Corte Interamérica. Concluyo entonces con una, con una pregunta para, para el Estado y que tiene que ver con eh, conocer cuáles son las medidas que toma el Estados Unidos, eh, particularmente el Departamento de Estado, para comunicar a, eh, a las autoridades estatales o federales, según sea el caso, eh, las medidas cautelares que dicta la, la Comisión. Eh, las medidas cautelares tienen un valor eh, fundamental para proteger la vida y la integridad eh, física de las personas, de las personas que se encuentran en el corredor de la muerte, y sería muy interesante conocer el, el, la manera en la cual la, Estados Unidos actúa para dar seguimiento a las medidas cautelares que dicta la Comisión. Muchas gracias, comisionado Hernández. En la audiencia también está presente la relatora especial de derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales, Soledad García Muñoz, así que le doy la palabra. Muchas gracias, eh, comisionado, relator de personas privadas de libertad y presidente de esta audiencia. Un saludo muy cordial para usted, para la relatora de país, la comisionada Clark, para el comisionado Hernández, como también para el honorable Estado de Estados Unidos de América y todas las representantes y los representantes de la sociedad civil, a quienes también saludo muy especialmente por el trabajo tan importante que hacen en defensa de los derechos humanos de las personas que están condenadas a muerte en Estados Unidos. Quisiera con, con su venia empezar también por sumarme a ese deseo que expresaba el comisionado Hernández de que algún día cercano se llegue a la abolición de la pena de muerte en este gran y, y, y bello país y, y expresar también bueno, la preocupación que me ha generado escuchar pues, los distintos relatos 
especialmente en cuanto a, a la situación de salud eh, y, y condiciones, ¿verdad?, que hacen a, a derechos eh, económicos y sociales de las personas privadas eh, de su libertad y condenadas a muerte en Estados Unidos. En ese sentido, mi pregunta en correspondencia con la de la comisionada Clark sería sobre qué medidas concretas se estaría tomando el Estado para atender a esas situaciones de, de salud, específicamente las que se han escuchado en esta audiencia, que han sido también bastante concretas y las que tienen que ver con los informes de fondo que la comisión ha, ha, ha expedido. En ese sentido, esos 10 informes de fondo también eh, dan cuenta por, por, por el perfil de las personas eh, que, que están condenadas a muerte eh, de ciertos factores que podrían propiciar en, en, en el país la aplicación de la pena de muerte. Y eso también desde mi mandato me inquieta en línea con la inquietud que, que expresaba el comisionado Hernández, ¿verdad? Cómo los factores socioeconómicos y raciales, si bien el señor Barnes nos explicaba muy bien cuáles son las, las, los contrapesos legales que existen para evitarlo, ningún sistema jurídico es perfecto y, y, y bueno, los números en cuanto a, a las personas ejecutadas de sus perfiles darían a entender que, que, que hay ciertos eh, factores de discriminación que pueden operar en las condenas. Así que eh, también pues instar a, a que se tengan en cuenta esos factores y sumándome también a, a, a los argumentos que, que, que no es el momento quizá de, de discutir sobre, sobre cuál es el alcance o el valor jurídico ¿verdad? De, las, de las recomendaciones de la Comisión. Sí quisiera destacar cómo en la propia opinión consultiva número 10, eh, que también dictó la Corte eh, sobre, sobre la interpretación de la declaración, la Corte reconocía el valor jurídico de la declaración como el instrumento que por naturaleza debe tenerse en cuenta para cumplir los, eh, los compromisos asumidos con la Carta de la OEA, la cual sí es un tratado internacional y sí vincula a Estados Unidos, así que ojalá también en algún momento cercano veamos una evolución en esta postura del Estado en sintonía con los estándares interamericanos. Muchísimas gracias, comisionado. Muchas gracias. Eh, yo en mi calidad de, de comisionado y de relator para las personas privadas de libertad y de combate a la tortura, quisiera pues, hacer algunas reflexiones en esta audiencia, comentar que la comisión ha abordado la cuestión de la pena de muerte como un reto crucial en materia de derechos humanos en los últimos 26 años. En el 2011 la comisión publicó un informe temático en el que declaraba su interés específico en el tema. Eh, cuando se publicó ese informe temático ya había examinado distintas situaciones de pena de muerte en casos relacionados a Estados Unidos, a Cuba, a otros países de la región. Eh, en este momento la Comisión también se había ocupado de la imposición de la pena de muerte en algunos países del Caribe. En ese contexto es un hecho que la pena de muerte es cada vez más cuestionada en los países que la mantienen. Hay distintas preocupaciones eh, citadas por la sociedad en torno al tema, como por ejemplo eh, que la imposición conlleva el riesgo de condenar a muerte a una persona inocente, o también han habido reflexiones respecto a que podrían darse eh, algún error de carácter judicial que haga que pueda ser arbitraria o injusta en un caso concreto, o incluso el costo también que supone para los sistemas judiciales los años en que eh, las personas pasan en tanto no se aplique eh, la pena como tal. Derivado, digamos, de todas esas preocupaciones, la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos se ha enfocado en desarrollar estándares eh, sobre la pena de muerte que definan sus restricciones, sus prohibiciones, eh, de acuerdo con diferentes instrumentos de derechos humanos que deben ser aplicados por los estados de la región. Para lograr este propósito, pues la Comisión ha examinado un gran número de peticiones y solicitudes de medidas cautelares que buscan reparar 
y proteger los derechos humanos de las personas condenadas a muerte. Sin embargo, aunque el desarrollo de estos estándares de derechos humanos ha sido cuidadoso, su efectividad no ha tenido eh, los resultados esperados frente a una pena que causa daños irreversibles en la vida de las personas. Y es por eso que en esta audiencia, digamos, este tipo de audiencias eh, sirven, eh, se hacen necesarias para que los actores involucrados en el tema sean activos y busquen la aplicación efectiva de los estándares de derechos humanos que cada vez resulta más evidente y crucial en este tema. Por lo que, digamos, eh, al igual como lo dijo el comisionado Joel Hernández, no me queda duda de la importancia de esta audiencia y creo que de ambas partes hemos escuchado pues, argumentos muy, muy importantes de los cuales tomamos nota. Así que, digamos, con esto cerramos la intervención de la Comisión Interamericana en esta parte de la audiencia y pasamos, pasamos a dar un tiempo de, de 12 minutos para que los representantes de los, de los beneficiarios puedan intervenir. Así que les vuelvo a trasladar la palabra a los beneficiarios por 12 minutos. Me tocan dos. Mr. Amanoff, do you want to get us started? Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Amanoff, and I represent Lesbian Mitchell in case 13570 and Julius Robinson in case 13361. Uh, notwithstanding the United States' constitution, laws, and policies, in both cases, the commission issued precautionary measures and merits reports, which found in favor of the petitioners and recommended the United States government bar their executions and conduct new trials. The commission also recommended that the United States initiate an investigation into the legality of the federal death penalty. As the commission carefully documented in its 2011 report on the death penalty, Enforcement and implementation of the Commission's reports and precautionary measures has been a continuing problem. One of the issues is that the United States Supreme Court has previously held that the decisions of international tribunals are not binding on non-federal entities in the United States. For this reason, we sought the Commission's intervention in Mitchell and Robinson's cases because these are federal death penalty cases. But despite the United States' participation in the litigation before this Commission, the United States continues to ignore the Commission's rulings. Indeed, the United States government has now executed at least four people, Juan Garza, Orlando Hall, Lisa Montgomery, and our client, Lesman Mitchell, notwithstanding precautionary measures and merits decisions in those people's favors. Robinson remains on federal death row, and the government thus far has refused to engage in settlement discussions despite our repeated invitations to do so. The United States federal government executed 13 people between July 2020 and January 2021. Given the Commission's continuing concerns about race as expressed in the 2011 report and in the merits reports in both Mitchell and Robinson's cases, it should be no surprise that the majority of those executed were people of color and the majority of federal death row today is made up of people of color who were tried before primarily white juries. In Robinson's case in particular, the commission expressed concern about the federal government's charging practices. The decision-making process by which the Department of Justice decides to seek the death penalty is largely confidential. Also confidential is the decision-making process that goes into deciding which cases to deauthorize from capital charges and the plea agreement process. As a result, although petitioners like Robinson are able to point to a discriminatory effect in terms of racial minorities receiving more death sentences, the shroud of confidentiality prevents petitioners from establishing discriminatory intent as is required to succeed on such claims in the domestic courts. Given the United States' refusal to implement the changes that the commission has outlined and their extreme action of executing petitioners like Mitchell, whose human rights this commission has found were violated, we are calling on the commission to facilitate a discussion between the parties to try to resolve these issues. We believe that in addition to the specific recommendations that the Commission has already made in the published reports in these cases, the United States should commit to total transparency in terms of charging and resolving death penalty prosecutions and all aspects of the lethal injection, lethal injection and execution date setting processes. They must commit to an open file policy such that all decisions can be reviewed by defense teams. In addition, 
DOJ should submit to a thorough investigation of its death penalty procedures by a neutral third party with the goal of ensuring that racial bias, be it implicit or explicit, has not invaded the death penalty decision-making process and to explain the discriminatory effect that we see in the death row population and in the racial makeup of capital juries. Finally, it is clear that certain administrations have been particularly aggressive in seeking the death penalty and executing those convicted. This demonstrates the arbitrariness of the death penalty process in the United States. While the DOJ has temporarily paused executions while it conducts a confidential review of some of the past administration's actions, that pause could end at any moment and executions could restart as they did last year. I'd also like to note that notwithstanding Mr. Burns referral to a moratorium, DOJ is currently pursuing capital prosecutions at trial and defending death sentences on appeal and in post-conviction. In order to permanently alleviate arbitrariness and re remedy the discriminatory effect, we call on DOJ, DOJ to pursue settlement and resentencing and recommend executive clemency in cases like Mr. Robinson's. I'd like to cede my remaining time to Professor Cesare Romano to further address the importance of member states respecting the commission's actions. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, I'm here speaking uh, both as a person who has been assisting Jonathan Aminoff and his colleagues in his work on the Julius Robinson case and the Mitchell case. That's the formal reason I'm here. But I think I'm also here because I am a, an expert on international uh, human rights and specifically on international adjudicative institutions. And lastly, I'm speaking from Los Angeles. So last week here in Los Angeles, the United States hosted the Summit of the Americas. And we know 23 leaders from throughout the Western Hemisphere gathered here to discuss common issues faced by all states in this hemisphere. Amongst the challenges that they discussed was the question of the erosion of democracy in our hemisphere and the dramatic inroads that countries that do not care for democracy and human rights are making in our continent. I would like to make a statement that I'm sure is not going to shock anyone in this meeting, is that it's in the US national interest to support the work of the Inter-American Commission. Actually, at the beginning of the meeting, I heard Mr. Freden saying and repeating that the US does support the Inter-American Commission. But does it? Well, I beg to defer. Like we are all here representing cases where the United States has been requested by the Inter-American Commission to do certain things or not to do certain things. And the reply that comes repeatedly from the Department of Justice and the State Department is stonewalling and complete disregard to the recommendations of the commission. I would like to say that that is not engaging with the commission, that is not supporting the commission. Paying the bills, of the Organization of American States and the Commission is not enough. The United States must support its institutions. Every time the United States refuses to engage with the Commission in finding a pragmatic way forward to settle the human rights cases that are brought to its attention, it undermines it. Every time it refuses to listen to the Commission, it provides an easy alibi to nations in Latin America and the Caribbean that are enabled then to do the same. Let's remind, remember this. International institutions are not a limitation of sovereignty. They are a multiplier of sovereignty because through international institutions, states can achieve goals that they cannot achieve easily by themselves. Even the United States needs strong international institutions to help it achieve its goals, which is protection of democracy and human rights in America, in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere and throughout the world. Now, make no mistake, I'm not saying that the United States should start treating the reports of the Inter-American Commission as legally binding. That is a red herring, that discussion. The United States can engage constructively with the Commission without conceding that general legal point. It can do so as a matter of comedy, but most of all, it needs to start doing that as a matter of national self-interest. Thank you. Honorable commissioners, uh, members of the secretariat and experts, thank you and good afternoon. 
My name is Sandra Babcock. I represent five of the victims in this proceeding, Jose Losa, Felix Rocha Diaz, uh, Erica Shepard, Melissa Lucio, and Krista Pike. I'd like to start by thanking the commission for its vigilant monitoring of the rights of prisoners sentenced to death in the United States over the last several decades. You might feel so Sometimes that your work has no impact when you see that prisoners are executed after you've issued precautionary measures or merits recommendations, but I assure you that is not the case. Your work has saved lives and you have built the most important body of jurisprudence on the application of the death penalty in the world. But most important, you are often the only body that has ever recognized the human rights violations that undermine the dignity and due process rights of our clients. You give them hope, and for that, we thank you. I'd also like to thank the United States, um, in particular for its efforts, both behind the scenes and in the courts on behalf of Mexican nationals facing the death penalty, whose rights were affected under the Avena judgment. Um, we are particularly grateful for your work in the case of Jose Losa. I think that the presence of the United States in this hearing also gives us hope that this is a new opportunity for reassessment of how the United States has engaged with the Commission and whether it's time for a change. President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris are openly opposed to the death penalty, and this is a first in US history. It's time for the United States to think about how it can creatively and proactively seek to implement the Commission's recommendations and precautionary measures. And there are so many ways that you can do this, even without abandoning your long held legal position that the Commission's recommendations are not legally binding, a position that we would urge you to reconsider. But even if you don't, there are things you can do. You can file amicus briefs in state courts where you urge state courts to accept and implement the Commission's recommendations out of deference and comedy. You can file letters with clemency authorities, urging them to do the same. You can make personal visits um, and meet with authorities, both in state attorney general's office, offices who are responsible for conditions of confinement in those states uh, and who are responsible for overseeing capital cases in their jurisdiction. You can support congressional action to repeal provisions of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act that curtail the power of the federal courts to review the merits of federal habeas corpus petitions. This legislation alone poses the greatest structural obstacle to implementation of the commission's merits recommendations and in and of itself constitutes a violation of prisoners' rights to access judicial remedies. Finally, I would encourage the United States to consider creating a national human rights institution whose mandate is to would encompass the treatment of cases brought before the commission. It is particularly problematic, I think, that officials who are responsible for implementing and defending the application of the death penalty in the United States are engaged in the treatment and response to the petitions filed by victims before this commission. Uh, in the meantime, before a national human rights institution is adopted, uh, it would be worth reconsidering whether this is the appropriate approach to cases before the Commission. Thank you very much. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Hemos entonces eh, escuchado a los representantes de beneficiarios. Vamos ahora por 12 minutos a escuchar al Estado. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to say that we appreciate uh, opportunities such as today's hearing uh, to engage with the IACHR and with civil society. Um, I found the uh, the presentations by the commissioners and the and the representatives of civil society uh, to be both uh, thoughtful and compelling. Um, and I would say that um, we are all uh, we're all human and we all 
uh, when it comes to to uh, things like uh, treating people decently and humanely, um, we all feel that this is uh, an imperative. Um, we feel that um, where there are shortcomings in our country, we try to remedy them. And the, um, this process, this iterative process that we have with the commission is part of that. Change comes, as, as, as change is evolutionary. And, and I think uh, you, you've mentioned, or the commissioner mentioned one of the, uh, the, the, the changing policies under the Biden administration. Uh, but as you know, we, we have a federal system. And so uh, you know, real change comes from the courts, it comes from legislatures, but it also comes from uh, engagements like this. We will take your questions uh, and your input back for consideration. Uh, and to the extent feasible, uh, we will um, um, try to provide you answers uh, consistent with our longstanding views on the, on the um, non-binding nature of the, of the recommendations. I mean, that, that the, the issue of binding, non-binding is, uh, we've, we've touched on it several times, and, and I, I think the U.S. position is quite clear, so there's no need to, to, to say it again. But um, as we stated at the outset of this hearing, uh, and in pro, uh, prior communication with the Commission, um, we're not in a position to go into details on individual cases, uh, nor are you asking us to today. Um, but I would note that the United States uh, receives a final report and recommendations uh, whenever we receive uh, a, a final report uh, and recommendations or, or precautionary measures resolution from the commission. Um, my office, the, the, the uh, USOAS, transmits it immediately to the relevant state or federal authority uh, for consideration and asks that it be taken under advisement. So uh, no recommendation of the commission goes uh, uh, unheard by those for, to whom it is intended, uh, for whom it is intended. Uh, we, we're um, uh, we take that responsibility uh, quite seriously. Um, so just in closing, I guess on behalf of the U.S. delegation, I want to take this opportunity to renew um, the appreciation of our government for the role of the IACHR in reviewing the human rights practices of member states, um, including our own, and uh, thank all those present today for your tireless efforts working on these very difficult issues. Thank you very much. Muy bien, entiendo que él estaba terminado su intervención en esta parte de la audiencia y pregunto a mis colegas si tienen algún comentario adicional antes de pasar al cierre de la misma si no veo que hay algún comentario Quisiera entonces señalar que la comisión espera que, que esta audiencia sea un punto de inflexión en el desarrollo de una estrategia conjunta para poder dar cumplimiento a distintas recomendaciones que hemos hecho y que de llegar peticiones a, nuestra, a nuestro seno, pues seguramente seguimos analizando y efectuando. Lo que la comisión busca es que se pueda promover alguna agenda positiva, proactiva, con el Estado, con las autoridades, con los representantes de víctimas, con la finalidad de promover el cumplimiento de distintas recomendaciones en, en casos específicos de informes de fondo, de medidas cautelares. Y también quisiera, antes de cerrar la audiencia, dejar una invitación abierta para el Estado a fin de, de tomar en cuenta la información compartida de esta audiencia y ojalá se pueda emprender alguna estrategia de seguimiento que, que pueda llevar a la implementación de las recomendaciones y consideramos que, que dar seguimiento a estas recomendaciones es eh, crucial para 
digamos, evitar eh, violación de derechos humanos y poder eh, avanzar en esta, en esta agenda. Así que, eh, sin más, quisiera entonces dar por, por cerrada esta audiencia y agradecer a todas las personas que nos han acompañado. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much.